Good morning. How's everybody this morning? Wow, a good looking crowd. We do have some uh, room on the front seats up here. I know it's the last to go, so we'll, we'll know if you're late because you'll be on the front seat at this point. So, uh, oh, oh, do we have a taker? Oh, good job, Melissa. Good She's job, Melissa. Coming up. That's take right. This is Melissa, Landon, Tucker, and James, everybody on the front seat. Woohoo! All right, yes. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Now you're celebrities. That's right. <laughs> well, like I said, we're so glad to have you here and uh, so blessed that we can finally get through the snow, right? Amen. Amen. So everybody stand with us this morning. We're going we're gonna to praise and worship. Amen. All right. Our first song today is going to be uh, No Holds on Me. You know, sometimes life can get you down. Things can get tough. The devil pushes on you. But with God, we know that he has no hold on us. Amen. So. Amen. All right, if you know it, sing it with us. If not, you'll know it next week. The devil thought he had a hold of me. He told so many lies that I believe. Got too weak to carry on. Thought that I was too far gone. But then I heard a voice from Calvary. I'm singing no more shackles on my feet The devil's got no hold on me Jesus' blood has set me free The devil's got no hold on me He's got no Mercy floods my soul. Though the enemy was near, I'm not giving in to fear. It's you're the voice of truth that leads me home. I want to hear you now. So, so I'm singing, no more shackles on my feet. The devil's got no hold on me. But it sets me free Enemy has been defeated. You believe that? Sing it out. Right Sing it out. here, right now, this is a sound of freedom. Sing it out. Sing it loud. No more shackles on my feet. The devil's got no hold on me. Sing it. No more shackles on my feet. The devil's got no hold on me. Jesus' blood. Jesus' blood has set me free. Today, give him a praise. Thank you, Lord. All right, how many of you believe fear is a liar? Amen. I know, uh, you know, things come at us and we have problems in our life and snowstorms happen and you can't get to work. But you know what? Fear is a liar because he is going to bring you through it when he brings you to it. Amen. Amen. All right, I know you know this one, so sing it. Sing it loud. Praise him as you do it. 
When he told you you're not good enough When he told you you're not right When he told you you're not strong enough To put up a good fight When he told you you're not worthy When he told you you're not loved When he told you you're not beautiful That you'll never be enough but just say, hey, hey, glad you're here. <laughs> All right, you may be seated. Good morning again. Good morning. Man, what a great crowd we have out here. I hope there's a great crowd online. Buddy, it was cold last week. You know how cold it was? It was so cold, the ice cream machines at McDonald's were working. <laughs> That's cold. 
Okay, guys, there's a theme to the announcements. We got a lot, but we're going to buzz through them. It is reset and recharge. Okay, we're going to reset first off and recharge with Wednesday nights coming up. Six o'clock, we're going to have some pizza from CeCe's. And then after that, devotion at 6.30. Is it CeCe's? Little Caesars. I do that all the time. I think it's intentional, and I don't realize These days, it. we'll have CeCe's. Yeah. <laughs> okay, on Wednesday night, we had a business meeting that was scheduled, and of course, the cold canceled that. Reschedule that for Wednesday, March 3rd. Okay, moving along. Real quick, I want to read Psalms 100 for you guys. Shout with joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him, singing with joy. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us, and we are His. We are His people, sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving. Go into the courts with praise. Give thanks to Him in His name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever. His faithfulness continues forever to each generation. Can I get an amen? Amen. So I bring Psalms up because we're going to discuss next Saturday at 8.30 in the morning, Psalms. I want you guys to come in. It's Men in the Way. Bring your favorite Psalms with you, and we're going to talk about Psalms in our lives. Um, it's such a beautiful book. It's kind of one of my go-to books. Um, we're going to have a great time. We're going to have some breakfast pizza and some coffee, so if you're invited, p please put it on your calendar. Next Sunday, we will have our communion, our once-a-month communion, so please do not forget about that. Just put that on the calendar for every last Sunday of the month. Uh, we started that with 2021. Then, Thursday, March 18th, The Real Women at 6 o'clock. Okay, The Real Women. They also have a sign-up in the lobby and in the fellowship hall for the... Secret Sisters, this is a tie-in. Christy has guidelines and a sign-up sheet, and it's right here. I was supposed to show it to you, but my hands are full. Okay. If you guys need one, um, let me know, and I'll make Zoe go get one for you. <laughs> our prayer request, speaking of reset again, we're resetting our prayer request. Our prayer request has been so successful, but we haven't updated it lately on social media. We don't know who we need to take off, who we need to keep on. So as of sometime this week, the social media prayer request will be reset. Please send in all your prayer requests on social media to Facebook or any other locations on social media. Okay. Also in the lobby is a sign up for prayer requests. Guys, we're serious about praying for you. We're a church that prays. We just need to know. We take prayer requests also on Wednesday nights. I think that is all the announcements, so if the ushers will please come forward. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just come to you, Lord. We just thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to be here, Lord. We just thank you for the blessings that you've given us for us. Uh, we just ask that you bless this day, bless this offering, and bless those that can give and those that, that cannot. Lord, just give us a great day, Lord, in your house today, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. When you're done giving your tithes and offerings, please stand to sing Evidence with us. I really like this song because uh, of the first verse. If you listen to a certain part of it, it kind of applies to what we've been going through lately. Oh, 
from or where you're bringing us to and just be with pastor buddy as he brings us the word today that we will apply it to our lives in jesus name we pray amen everybody doing today we doing good amen amen god is good he's so good now is there any readers here in the house? Anybody like to read besides Buster? I know Buster's a reader. All right, cool. All right, so you know me. I, I'm always liking to read and go to Mardell and look for the greatest stuff that you can find on sale. <laughs> uh, if you're a guy and you um, like to read, I strongly suggest this book. It's Seven Friends That Every Man Should Have. And it's a good read. And you know what? It's free. I will just give it to you. If you promise me you'll read it, please come grab one. We'll have them available out in the lobby. I think I've got like five or six copies of this. And then also, couples, non-couples, if you just want to know what your love language is, this is a phenomenal book. Some of you may have heard of it. It's Gary Chapman. Uh, it's The Five Love Languages. And it's a great read because it's all about communication, right? 90% of fights that argue that take place other than money it's because of miscommunication, right? I'm miscommunicating to Christy all the time. <laughs> and I've learned through the years that uh, I've learned, learning, let me say that, to communicate better through her love language. So this is good stuff. Again, they're free. If you promise me, you'll read it. Last but not least, I feel like I'm on an infomercial, but let's keep going. <laughs> If you have never read the Bible in chronological order, let me know. We will give these out to you. These chronological Bibles are amazing. They're actually by the date. So many times we want to read the Bible and we just don't know where to start, right? We're like, well, pick that here. 
And this takes it out, and it breaks it down from the beginning of time with Adam and Eve and goes on from there. It's good stuff. It's a New Living Translation. Easy to read, easy to understand. It's good stuff. And it'll keep you on task to read your Bible through in a year. Not that you just need to read it because we need to study and apply it as well. But if you haven't done that in a while, this will get you jump started. So just a few resources uh, that are available for you for free if you'd like one. With the promise, you'll read it, all right? Now, lastly, I'd like to uh, talk really quick about the men and women's groups that getting ready to start up. When I was at Fort Jackson, uh, every new recruit that comes in, you get assigned a battle buddy. Now, it's a pain in the hiney because everywhere you go, you've got to have your battle buddy with you, all right? I mean, you literally can't even go to the bathroom. You can't even get water. You've got to have your battle buddy with you. And I didn't understand it at first until I needed to go somewhere and my battle buddy was right there with me. Now, the reason why I say that is Ephesians 6.12, and I'm going to read it for you. I had to pull it up on my phone because I like to read it out of the easy translation. It says this, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Can I tell you something? When it comes to discipleship, there's nothing better than having a battle buddy that you can take with you to get through this crazy thing called life. And it's done through discipleship. Now, a lot of times we meet in large men's and women's groups, and that's great, and that's really good, and that draws you closer to the Lord. But can I strongly suggest discipleship? You taking on another person or them taking you on or you taking on two or three or however many and just taking time to be honest, to be able to be real, to be able to share, to have a prayer partner, it's huge. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and if you know who he is, he was martyred. He was 39 years old. It's a concentration camp. He said this about discipleship. Discipleship is commitment to Christ because Christ exists. He must be followed. An idea about Christ, a doctrinal system, a general religious recognition of grace or forgiveness of sins does not require discipleship. In truth, it even excludes discipleship. It is inimical to it. One enters into a relationship with an idea by way of knowledge, enthusiasm, perhaps by even carrying it out, but never by personal obedient discipleship. Christianity without the living Jesus Christ remains necessarily a Christianity without discipleship. A Christianity without discipleship is always Christi Christianity without Jesus Christ. It is an idea, a myth. A Christianity in which there is only one God the Father, but not Christ as living Son, actually cancels discipleship. In that case, there will be trust in God, but not discipleship. Now that's a mouthful, right? Let me give you the, the Spark Notes version of it, all right? We can know God, but we won't know God until we get in with someone else and we can bounce ideas off them, right? We can study and say, hey, what do you think this means? So many times we're afraid to dive into it or maybe we don't know where to go. We don't have the resources, whatever it is. Now, again, I wanted to give a disclaimer. Don't think you've got to have a theology background to disciple someone else or you've got to be a Christian for many years. It's just two people with their Bible saying, you know what, what do you think this means? And you get together. I promise you, if you will enter into discipleship, a relationship of discipleship, you will benefit so much. I strongly suggest that. So I preface that, please come next Saturday. If you're a guy, please come, 8.30. We're really quick and easy. I mean, you know, half hour, maybe an hour but uh, it just gets you set up if you can make it, and uh, just strongly suggest that. I mean, discipleship is amazing. The women do a phenomenal job every month. They always pack the house, and they've got all kinds of stuff. I'm trying to figure out how we can get some tools involved in our discipleship uh, men's group, right? I mean, we like tools, right? I mean, come on. we got to figure something out. Oh, I tell you, God is good. It's good to see everybody. Welcome. We're so blessed to have everybody here, and uh, if you haven't been here for a while, let me bring you up to speed. We're in a sermon series called Knowing, growing, and showing. I always want to say growing first. And it's knowing, growing, and showing. We're going through Romans 13, 14, 15. And we're talking about how we're growing in the Lord. And again, it goes right back to discipleship, right? We can know God, but do we know him? Let me say it this way. We can know God, know of God, but do we know him? And I think that's something we all struggle with. And many times it's because we just don't know where to go. We don't know what to do. Now, a big topic, and really the subject of today's sermon, is judgment. How many of you like to be judged? Raise your hand, loud and proud. Not one? You mean you don't like to be? No, none of us like to be judged, right? 
None of us like to feel the peering eyes of coming into a little bitty church. <laughs> Let's just be honest, right? We automatically feel like we're being judged. I want to say this. You've entered into a place where we're just going to love on you. We're going to let the word of God speak, but we're just going to love on you. We want you to be real. We want you to be open. We want you to be honest. If you have a need, let us know. We just try to preach the word of God. Let his word speak. We're not going to judge. However, there is a time to judge. And that's what we're going to talk about. But it reminds me of a story. This preacher was really going forward. I mean, he was letting, the, he was letting his congregation have it. Sweat fall, flying off. And he was talking to him about judgment and going to hell. He said, church member, you're going to go to hell. And he is just letting them have it. This one man down front just kept smiling. He preached harder, and he said, church members, you're going to hell if you don't turn from your ways. This guy's just smiling that much more. So he keeps going, and he finally gets right up in him. He says, church member, if you don't turn from your ways, you're going to go to hell. The guy sits there and smiles and said, hey, I'm not a church member. <laughs> All right, there you go. Let's line it up a little bit, right? <laughs> but, I mean, there is a time to judge, and we don't like talking about that because of this right here. So many times... We get two terms mixed up. We get judgment mixed up with condemnation. You may realize that? We get judgment mixed up with condemnation. And that's sad because as Christians, believe it or not, you and I are called to judge. However, we sing about it. You ever hear Tupac or Lecrae sing about only God can judge me? We like to hear that said all the time. People love that, right? People proudly will tell others that. Only God can judge me, right? You ever seen it? Sometimes they even have it tattooed on them, right? Only God can judge me. And we have all these different things that we see. People want, don't want other people to judge them because why? People want to live the way they want to and don't want anybody to tell them any different. Amen? And, and let's just be real. Nothing I hate worse than somebody telling me no. I'm just being real with you right now. You know, you tell me no, I'm going to work that much harder to get you to tell me, tell me, tell me yes. I mean, that's just the way I am. That is my DNA. But I say we must judge, and you might be thinking, but wait a minute, doesn't the Bible say something? I was quoted this growing up, and I'll never forget it, Matthew 7, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it in the King James, because my mother would point her sweet little finger at me, and she would say, judge not, lest ye be judged. And she would point her little finger at me, and she would shake her head like that, judge not, lest ye be judged, King James. So we hear this, and we automatically think we're not supposed to judge, right? We hear that. However, Jesus goes on in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, and says this, Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit, that is, by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Think about that for just a minute. How are we going to understand that if we don't judge someone's actions? Okay. Now, contextually, hang in with me. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna tidy this up a little bit, but let's look at it this way. Well, first off, let me preface this. Is anybody here named Johnny or Connie? All right, good. All right, all right. I'm just, I'm just that, you know, if you're watching online, this is not aimed at you, but I just, I have my little go-tos that I have to say that. All right. How many times do we go to church or we've heard of someone going to church and the condemning con Connie is going to come at you, right? They're going to judge you. It happens. Let's be honest. It's happened to all of us. And if you're being real, if it hasn't, you're worried about someone laying those eyes on you and giving you that condemning glare. We all deal with that. So if, by the world's standards, if we're not supposed to judge, what are we going to do if little Johnny starts climbing up on the rafters and hanging from him? Are we just going to sit there and look at little Johnny and say, only God can judge him, bless his heart? No, you, that's not what we're going to do, right? We're going to judge that action. Prayerfully, the parent's going to tan his hide, right? And he'll do it once, and then he won't do it again. And, and we're going to judge that action. Same thing for me or you. When we are in a church context, and this is what I want to bring it back to, this is really what we're talking about, but you can apply it to other areas of your life. Within the church, we have to judge the actions or the fruits, if you will. Let me clarify it even more. If I stand up here and I present to you a false gospel, it is your job, your responsibility to corner me on it, to let's have a discussion about it, let's get it figured out, okay? I mean, that is your job as well as mine. You are to judge my fruit, my actions, the way it is. Now, I'm not talking follow me around at Walmart, right? Because I get frustrated at Walmart in the shopping aisles. You know, we, I talk about that all the time. Let's just be real. People, why do they have to park their cart sideways? And they're just looking, and I'm just sitting there smiling. Or oh, are you trying to get through here? Oh, no, I just like watching you look for soup. 
You know, I mean, it drives me crazy, right? It does. I mean, yes, I'm trying to get through here. <laughs> Please move. So let's look at these two terms, judging and condemning, really quick. Judging, all right, says this, to objectively evaluate someone, now here we go, based on biblical standards of conduct and morality. Let me repeat that. To objectively evaluate someone based on biblical standards of conduct and morality. What does condemning mean? Well, here we go. Forming a negative, usually self-righteous opinion about someone because they do not measure up to your biblical standards. Okay? Let's talk about some gray areas for just a minute. We all have what, they're call, what they call convictions, right? It's the gray areas, if you will. All right? I mean, the Bible is really black and white. However, there are gray areas, if you will. Christy has convictions that I don't agree with. I have convictions that she doesn't agree with. However, because we are in a marriage relationship, I respect her convictions. She respects mine. We come together. The problem is, if I am trying to beat James down with the Bible over my conviction, is that fair to him? Am I judging him or am I condemning him? I'm condemning him, right? I mean, on and on and on we could go, and we're going to unpack this a little more. But there is a difference. However, what we're getting at today, the context of where we're at is in Romans chapter 14. And there's this crazy thing going on in Romans chapter 14. So if you've got your Bibles, please turn there, and I'll set this up. I mean, it's so big, Paul just wore me out on it. I'm going to be honest with you. I, you read chapter 14, you just get wore out on these two things that they're fighting over. They're fighting over meat, and they're fighting over the day of the week that they worship on. And I mean, I mean, seriously, we don't think it's a big deal now, but to them, it was driving the church apart. And it was so bad, Paul devotes a whole chapter to it. Romans chapter 14 deals with condemning others and their actions. Now, the way we do things here in this church, if you brought your Bible or you got your iPad, your iPhone, whatever, we should have a Bible in the back of our, we encourage you to grab it. If not, hang in there and uh, you're going to hear it. I always go through it. Otherwise, keep your finger there and we'll always go back to that main verse. My pop-up verses will be up on the board. If you're a note taker, please take, them, take notes and uh, any questions, let me know. All right, my sermon in a sentence. I always like to wrap up my sermons with a sentence. Give a little grace. Everyone's story is unique. And every situation has a context. Think about that. Give a little grace, although it should be give a lot of grace, because God gives us a lot of grace. Everyone's story is unique, and every situation has a context. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just come to you, and I just thank you so much. Father, I thank you for your son Jesus, first and foremost. Lord, I just thank you that you love us so much that you sent Christ to die on the cross for our sins. Not just anyone but everyone, Father. He died so that all who believe in him can have everlasting life. I ask that you take me from me, Father. May the words I speak be yours and yours alone. May the Holy Spirit anoint me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet, Father. May we have open ears in this congregation. Lord, help us just to take what you would have us to take and apply it to our lives the rest of the week. <laughs> Father, we love you and ask this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so this huge fight going on in the Roman church. I mean, they're fighting over meat, and they're fighting over the day of the week that we worship on. Does anybody here work retail? Has anybody here ever worked retail? There we go. Has anybody ever worked on a Sunday? You're going to hell. I'm kidding. <laughs> I mean, right? We hear those things. It drives us nuts. I remember being so convicted when I worked retail, and I worked Sundays. Now, back in the day when I worked retail and worked Sundays, Walmart, yes, I used to work there, didn't open up till noon, all right? So I could go to church. If I'm being real, I didn't go to church because I wasn't, you know, where I needed to be, but I could have. I did on occasion, Easter and Christmas, if I'm just being real. But we live in a society today where you've got to work sometimes seven days a week. Sometimes we don't get days off. Do you really think that God is going to look down on you because you've got to provide for your family or provide? No, right? But these condemning commies, connies, and we're going to talk about them quite often, they like to make you think you're doing something bad sometimes. But Romans chapter 14, these people were fighting over the meat. And, and the fight over the meat was this. Some of it had been previously offered to idols. 
So they could get it cheaper, all right? You could get it cheaper. You could get the meat cheaper that way. Some of them had the conviction that we're still under the Jewish law because God said you shouldn't eat meat that had been offered to idols. So they stayed away from it. Some who had probably more money would get their meat straight from the butcher, all right? It was untouched. I don't know if it was Wagyu or not, but, you know, I mean, it was probably a little better quality, right? It hadn't been roiled or roasted or whatever. But there was this huge fight in the church over someone, whether or not they ate the meat. And some of them were so convicted, they wouldn't even eat meat in general. They would just eat vegetables. And there was a fight, rumble, royal, you know, WWE style probably. I mean, I'm kidding. But, you know, they were just fighting over this meat and, and bickering back and forth. And it was driving the church nuts. Well, then, not only that, they were fighting over the day of the week that some worshipped on. Not everybody could get to church on Saturday back then, so maybe some of them worshipped on Sunday. I don't know. We don't know. The Bible doesn't dive into it too much. But we do know this. There was some condemning connies within the congregation that were pointing their finger, that were telling others this, that were trying to make them feel bad, even though these people were probably just trying to worship the Lord. Do people want to go to church and feel out of place? No, none of us do, right? And, and I mean, can I be real for just a second? That's, I think, the popularity of the bigger churches because you can slip in and slip out, right? I noticed some of y'all today, you come and you're like, oh, dear Lord, <laughs> I can't slip in the back. I mean, I get it. I was there. I remember. It's tough. It is. It is. But the great thing about a small church is we're going to love on you. We're going to know you. We're going to help you if you need anything. We're family. We truly are a family. But let's go back to what the Bible says. You see, Paul preached, more importantly, Jesus preached, that it's not what goes in that sins, it's what comes out. Now, hold on. It's your actions. That's what he's talking about. It's your actions. It's not what comes in, it's what comes out. Meaning the meat didn't matter if it had been previously offered to idols or not. It did hold no difference. It mattered what your actions were. That's what was the big deal. But some weren't strong in the faith. And that's really what we're diving down to. People are in different stages of Christianity. We're all growing at different levels, at different intervals. This letter was written to all the condemning connies out there, trying to chill them out, male and female, and to encourage you and I to realize, know, and understand meat or whatever it is, it's not gonna, it's not gonna keep us from the Lord. All right. Same thing with the day. So let's read. Here we go. Romans chapter fourteen, verse one through thirteen. New Living Translation says this: Accept other believers who are weak in the faith, and don't argue with them about what they think is wrong, right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it is right to eat anything, but another believes with a sensitive conscience will only eat vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do. For God has accepted them. Here we go. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. In the same way, someone, some think one day is more holy than another. Excuse me, while others think every day is alike, you should each be fully convinced that whatever day you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor Him. Those who eat any kind of food do so to honor the Lord. Since they give thanks to God before eating, and those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give ourselves to God, for we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. For if we live, it's to honor the Lord. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be the Lord of both the living and of the dead. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we all will stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. 
Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. That's a mouthful. Did you see how many times he referenced meat and how many times the holy day? This was a big issue. Now, if you've ever been talking about small churches in small churches before, little issues can get big really quick. And it's stupid. Can I just be honest? It's stupid. Fuss, fight, and argue over the dumbest things. What color carpet are we getting? You know? Well, well, do we put the flag on this side or that side or what do we? I mean, literally, they have meetings over moving these things. Churches have been split over flags. And I'm not even kidding you. It's the craziest thing ever. Paul is just telling them three things, in my opinion. Love people where they're at. It's about him. And just do you. All right? I think of Sydney every time I say that. I like to hear her say, she's like, just do you, boo. (laughs) And and it's so true. I believe it's those three things that we're going to bring to light in these 14 verses. So let's look at number one. Let's unpack verses one and two. In verses one and two, we see Paul urge the church to love the weaker in faith where they're at. Grace begins by loving people where they are. Do we realize that? Grace begins by loving them where they're at. Not everybody is a seasoned Christian. Not everybody has a thorough understanding of the Lord. They may want that, but they may not have that. Verse 1 says this, Accept other believers who are weak in the faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it is all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will only eat vegetables. And I love what Paul says here. Don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. Don't condemn them, just love them. Is it hard to love somebody where they're at? Let's just be real. It it can be, right? You want someone to be so invested in the Lord, but yet they're not there yet. That can be hard, can it? Especially if it's a family member or a child, man, that can really drive you nuts. We have to start by loving them where they're at. Paul says, don't condemn them, just love them. You see, people were still struggling to realize they've been set free. They no longer lived under the law in this context of the church. They were free from the law. But yet they still had that conviction to not eat that meat. And I know it sounds crazy, and you're going to get tired of hearing about meat and vegetables and and days of the week, but this is how important it was. The church was dividing over this very thing. And and I love what Paul says in verse 4. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge them, whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. I like how John Ortberg kind of sums this up. He had Abram take a walk, Elijah take a nap, Joshua took a lap, and Adam take the nap. He gave Moses a 40-year timeout, he gave David a harp and a dance, and he gave Paul a pen and a scroll. He wrestled with Jacob, he argued with Job, whispered to Elijah, warned Cain, and comforted Hagar. He gave Aaron an altar, Mary a song, Gideon a fleece, Peter a name, and Elijah a mantle. Jesus was stern with the rich young ruler, tender with the woman caught in adultery, patient with the disciples, blistering with the scribes, gentle with the children, and gracious with the thief on the cross. God never grows two people the same way. God is a hand crafter, not a mass producer. I love that, don't you? He is hand crafting you right where you're at to be who he's called you to be. The problem we get into is we try to take someone else and make them just like us. And we do it through condemnation. And this is what Paul is getting at here. He, he's saying the same thing. Let's, let's bring it back to us. Anybody here like music? Like listen to music? All right, I love music. All right, I do. Chili's here and he likes music too, right? Sound system, thanks to Chelly Sound Waves in there, you know? So, I mean, if you want to hear something, okay, I hate to get off track here, but if you want to hear some cool stuff, come here on a Wednesday night after church, and we will bump these speakers like no tomorrow. It's awesome. All right, anyways, let me get back to it. But music is a big deal, right? And if you share that love of music to another Christian, and this Christian only listens to, you know, K-Love or whatever, are they going to look down on you? 
You mean you listen to regular music? You don't listen to Caleb 24-7? No, we're human, right? We like the 80s, 90s, 70s, or whatever it is, right? We like other types of music, right? You mean you watch regular movies? You don't just watch pure flicks all the time? I mean, come on, you know? You, you, you know people like this? We all do. Let's just be honest. We all do. If someone is listening to music they shouldn't, or watching movies they shouldn't, and if they're Christian, God will condemn them. Let's think about that, and it's so true. I'm going to share my heart with you. Don't think bad of me. Growing up, I grew up in the 80s in California, right? I loved rap. I mean, I had big speakers in the back of my truck. I mean, you know, I was just, it was nuts. But anyways, and I listened to some music today that if I had hair, it would curl and fall out, all right? I'm just being honest with you, you know? And the funny thing about it is, my wife sings and knows music. That's how she worships the Lord. I mean, she listens to the lyrics. Me, if it's got a beat, I'm just like, mm-hmm, let's go. You know, and I'm dancing, you know. She's like, have you heard the lyrics to that? I'm like, no, but do you hear the beat? You know, and I'm just doing this. She's like, no, you really need to listen to the lyrics. And I'm like, oh, wow, you're right. <laughs> you know, here, let's turn it, you know. And, 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 and it is. In our context of marriage, it's different because I value her opinion. She's my partner. If she come at me, and we weren't married, or we weren't friends, or we weren't discipling, or whatever it was, would that not come off as as condemning? See what I'm getting at? You can encourage. Trust me, you can encourage. But when we condemn and we come at them hard, that's what turns people away. And this is really the root of what Paul is getting at. You know, and and it's been said this way, remember, you're not someone else's Holy Spirit. Think about that. You're not someone else's Holy Spirit. I don't know who penned it, but I I ran across it. I thought that was really good. It's something we all can take to heart. Paul says it this way in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 2 and 3. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other. Making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. In the church context, we do. We have to be united in spirit through peace. Remember, grace begins with loving them where they're at, and it continues by remembering it's not about you, it's about him. It's not about you, it's about him. In verse 7 and 9, we see Paul remind the church that when we give our lives to Christ, it's no longer us that lives, but it's he who lives in us. It's Christ who indwells in us. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it is to honor the Lord. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose. To be the Lord of both the living and the dead. You see, Paul is trying to remind them, hey, it's not about you, it's about him. It's the whole reason why we're gathering together. It's not about you. Our lives no longer are about you. They're about him. Now, I don't know about you, but is that hard to swallow sometimes? I like me. I'm just being honest, you know. I like me. I'm selfish. It's hard. But Paul is saying, dude, it's not about you. We have to remember that. And I think that's hard, especially in the world we live in today, because it's a me-centered world, right? Better, faster, stronger, quicker, whatever it is. We're the microwave generation. I want it, and I want it now, you know. I, I mean, that's what we live under. I love this. A group of tourists were visiting this beautiful village. I forget where it was. And the tourist asked the gentleman sitting there, and he said, were any great men born in this village? He said, no, only babies. <laughs> Think about it, right? Great men are not born that way. Great women are not born that way. They are raised through that way. We have to struggle and fight and get through this thing called life in order to be who God has called us to be. Every born-again believer starts life as a baby Christian. You realize that? Everybody. Does everybody turn 13 and automatically confess Christ as their Lord? No, we don't do that, do we? Some are 60, some could be 80, some could be 7. I mean, you know, it's different for all of us. And I think sometimes we try to impose what we went through, our lives, on someone else. And we try to make them more like us, right? We, We try so hard. But it's not about you and I. When we become Christians, we don't live for ourselves. It's not about us anymore. Now, granted, we still have to live life, all right? We still have to go to work. We still have bills to pay. You know, we still have vacations to plan. You know, but it's not about us. It's about him and honoring Christ and doing what God has called us to do. The Great Commission is truly the great omission. None of us think about it. 
We're just trying to get to Friday. Think about that. When you start work on Monday, what are you working for? You're working for Friday. And then Sunday comes around, you're like, oh, Lord, we got to do it again. But if we take every day as the Lord's day, Psalm 118, 24, my favorite psalm. Today's the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. We can take every day and we can find something to rejoice God about. We can take every day and say, you know what, God? What would you have me to do today? How can I honor you? How can I further the gospel for you today? Now, granted, that's going to take time out of your day, all right? Pause your TikTok, you know, pause your Netflix for a little bit, you know. I mean, you're, you're, it's not about you. It's not. It's about God and honoring him. You, you, you ever met a new believer and they are on fire for the Lord? Anybody know someone? They are on fire. And then what happens when life hits them? The air's let out in them, right? They're like, man, did this, did this really work? <laughs> you know? Where, where'd you go, Lord? I, I'm still getting flat tires and dead batteries. Well, you're, you're in life, and that's what's going to come your way. But God is still right there with us. So then if you do take someone, then if you're not careful, you can start putting your convictions on him or her. Well, I quit smoking 10 years ago. I mean, I never smoked, but I'm just saying, this is someone saying this. I, I mean, you know, and, and so therefore, my conviction is to make everybody around me not smoke. You, you see what I mean? Your convictions, if you're not careful, become others. And you've got to love people where they're at. Because can I tell you something? Smoking ain't going to send someone to hell. Like Pastor John would always say, you may smell like it, but, but you're not going there, all right? <laughs> that was my mentor, if this is your first time here. He'd always say, I get a kick out of it. But anyways, we take those things and we try to impose them on others. We've got to let people grow in their own ways. We've got to love them, but it starts with them realizing it's not about them, it's about him. But I can't convict that on you, and you can't convict that on me. It takes my own time learning that. And can I tell you something? It took me a long time to learn that, and I'm still struggling with it. You know? It's not about me, it's about him. Paul says this in the church in Corinth, 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things. We all grow up at different times in our lives. And can I tell you something? Sometimes we revert back to childhood. But thank God when we're saved, we come right back to it. Amen? That's the grace of God. That's the, the amazing thing of God. We've got to give people a little grace in their lives and not be quick to condemn. Lastly, you better just do you, boo. All right? In verse 10 and 12, Paul says this. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we all will stand before the judgment seat of God. For the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me. Every tongue will declare allegiance to me. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. Paul once again is warning his church, man, let them take care of them. You do you right? You do you. Moody says this, D.L. Moody, and, and I don't know if you're familiar with Moody or not, but he was a popular evangelist back in the 18, 1900s, and uh, he writes real old school English, and I'll be honest with you, I struggle with it, all right? But listen to what he says. This is an illustration. A blind man in a great city was found sitting on a street corner with a lantern beside him. Someone went up to him and asked him why he had the lantern since he was blind. And the light of it was the same to him as darkness. The blind man simply replied, so that no one may stumble over me. Do you realize that you and I are one of two things? We're either a stepping stone or a stumbling block to someone. We're like our own little road sign. We either point people to Jesus or they take the U-turn. I mean, think about that. That's, that's incredible stuff when we really dive into that. If we realize that we're a stumbling block or a stepping stone to someone else's salvation. Now, again, the context of this letter is within the church, but I believe you can take this in other areas of your life and apply it just the same way. But it still happens in the church today. You see, one thing we have at this church, we keep the main thing, the main thing. Been saying it since five years ago, September 11th, 2016? Yeah, 2016. Five years coming up this year. Let's keep the main thing, the main thing. Let the Bible guide this church. But do you realize churches divide and, and people want to stand on their ground? People want to talk about King James Version and other translations. Jesus had the King James. 
No, he didn't. It was in 1611. <laughs> Jesus had Hebrew and Greek, all right? Let's just be real. And then you have others want to talk about tattoos and hairstyles and hymns or praise worship, smoking or moderate consumption of alcohol, denomination against denomination, speaking in tongues, on and on and on we can go. People just want to pick fights over stupid stuff that don't matter. What matters is knowing God and making him known. That's the only thing that matters and growing in a relationship with him. That's all that church should be. You know, I heard this example the other day. We treat churches like we do vacations. It's the destination. I'm going to go and worship Jesus at the Way Community Church on Sunday. No, you're here to fill the tank up and keep going. I mean, you know, that's exactly what it is. We're like a gas station. You're here to get filled back up and keep gone going, you know? We're like a Bucky's one of these days. Anybody ever in the Bucky's in Texas? You know you want to go, all right? If you haven't been, you need to, all right? They're supposed to be really great. But we like the nice big gas stations, don't we? We like the ones that you go in there. And I mean, and we're the same way when it comes to churches, right? I mean, we're like a mixture between Casey's and, I don't know, Quick Trip, maybe. I don't know, you know? We're getting better every day, every, every week. We're doing our best. But Jesus, talking to disciples, says this. And this is where we really need to get serious for just a second. Anyone who welcomes, this is talking about little kids. Anyone who welcomes a little child like this on my behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trusts in me to fall into sin... It would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Now, I know God loves children, but can I tell you something? He loves you enough to die for you as well. And I promise you, he cares just as much for you as he does a little child. The point to that is, do you want to condemn somebody and cause them to stumble and possibly even go away from the Lord? No. So just come to church, go to work, your circle of influence, what it is, and just shine the light of Jesus. Just shine like Jesus as much as you can. You're not Jesus, and we all got to remember that, right? But just shine like him as much as you can. Paul says this, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, For there is one body, one spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father for all, who is over all, in all, and living through all. That means, you know what? Keep the main thing the main thing. Everything else is like sprinklings on an ice cream cone, right? Let's just keep the main thing the main thing. Let's worship the Lord. Let's go on down the road. Let's not let stupid things get in the middle of everything. We're getting ready to have a business meeting on Wednesday. And can I tell you something? God is getting ready to do some amazing things. Now, I'm not trying to butter you up for the business meeting. Don't get me wrong. But what I'm saying is we're getting ready to do some do some amazing things in here. If we all agree on it, that's going to not only provide more money for the church, it's going to provide us to be able to buy a permanent facility, but it's going to make us to where other people know about us and not go, where are you at? You're, you're over there by the laundromat? <laughs> I drove over there and didn't see you. <laughs> I, I need to have a flashing light out here. You know, we're here, we're here, we're here. But it, it, it excites me to be able to come up with these things. And you all have to be excited as well about it. It's not about being excited about me or whatever. It's about being excited about Christ and reaching the lost. And not when they come into church making someone feel out of place. Amen. The world does that enough. Can we not do that as Christians? Can we just come in here and worship the Lord and love on each other and be there for each other? This timeless letter was written 2,000 years ago, but yet it still applies to us this very day because people are still fighting over meat and days of the week, just in different forms. God's grace has been extended to us, so we must extend his grace to others. We've got to love them where they're at. Now, again, we, we want to hold people accountable. We want, to, we want to grow on them. We want to love on them. But we do it in a way as to not turn them from the Lord, but turn them towards him. Let your light shine. God wants there to be unity in the church because in the church is where we can reach the lost. We come here, we fill our tanks up, and we go to where our circle of influence is. If you're a plumber, it's where you plumb. If you're a welder, it's where you weld. If you're a teacher, it's where you teach. We come here to hear the word of God. You don't come here to hear me. You come here to have God speak to you. Last story, and I'll close it. When I was in boot camp, we had a drill sergeant. I tell you what, he was mean as a snake. He would look at you, and you would just be like, oh, Lord, <laughs> don't, don't make eye contact. But one thing he said was this. 
when we would do our PRT, our physical readiness training, every morning we'd roll around in the sand at 4 o'clock in the morning. I know it was fun, let me tell you. We would do that for two hours. And then he'd say, the rest of the day is on you. I'm like, what are we talking about? I'm here, I'm sore, I can't move. <laughs> I just ran four miles, you know, and we mean it's on me. I realized it when I got back, what that means. I had my mom's candy cane cookies. I didn't have someone yelling at me to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. And I packed on a little weight. I'm just being real with you, all right? But those words ring true. It's on me to continue to stay after my weight, to stay in shape, to Army standards. I say that to say this. It's on you to do that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You're not going to grow in the Lord if you just come here two days a week. You've got to do your part. It's on you. Let's, let's close the, the, uh, the sermon out. But I pray that, that this made some sense to you and, and, and prayerfully it uh, helped you with where we're at. We, we hear these things about judging and, and in the Christian context, we are to judge the actions of others. We are to judge within the confines of a church. We have personal convictions. But let's encourage and not discourage. That's truly what the Christian life is about. It's about encouraging others to just love on the Lord and just to be his. Keep the main thing the main thing and not get caught up in all the hoopla that can happen within the church. Because can I tell you why? We are living in a time where nobody wants to come to church. We are living in a time, and I'm not saying anything to you all watching TV here. We're living in a time where it's easier to stay on your couch and go and watch TV. And you're on your phone. Your phone. Did I just make that word up? You're on your phone and you're flipping through social media while you're watching whatever service it is. Do you see what I mean? There, there are things that we need to retain to in today's world. And it's a safe place where people can come and they can worship the Lord and they can feel like, you know what? That's a home. We have a saying here. The first time you come, you're a guest. The next time you come back, you're family. And that's so true. That's what we want. We're going to love on you. I need you to love on me too. Sometimes you need to knock me in the head and get me back on straight. I mean, it's a two-way thing. You don't just come here to sit in the pews to hear me. I don't come here just to watch you. We're just going to love on each other. Amen? Let's stand and let's worship. Let's close this thing out. Let's rock it. If you're here and you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, or if you're watching with us on TV, I urge you to make that choice today. Or maybe you're here and you need prayer. Maybe you're here and you want someone to just pray with you. We have two altars. Please make yourself at home. Whatever you need, we want to help facilitate that. Let's worship.
say, Father, we just thank you so much. Father, we praise you for who you are. We thank you for your son, Jesus, and what he did for us on the cross. Lord, I just pray that your message made sense today. Lord, that we hide it in our hearts, that, that your word is just right there, that we are to judge actions of other Christians, but we are not to condemn them. Father, I pray this church, your church, is a place of refuge, is a place of safety, where people can come to hear your word, not watered down, not diluted for what the world has to say, but find it in a place that, you know what, we're going to love them where they're at. Because you love me where I'm at. None of us are perfect. The Bible tells us we've all fallen short of God's glorious standard. We've all missed that mark. And Father, we thank you that through grace and mercy extended through your son, Jesus, we can love each other and we can be the light on the hill to bring someone else to you. Father, I just pray, Lord, that you encourage us today, that you encourage us to, to go out wherever our circle of influence is, in the workplace, at home, and that we just let your light shine through us, that we be the hands and feet of your son, Jesus. Father, keep us safe as we go out. Lord, I just ask your blessings upon us. May we glorify you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you haven't been here in a while, come back Wednesday. Dave is going to do an amazing Bible study starting Wednesday. Go with